I'm from Queen's, as, uh, as, as you know, I've worked from the School of Modern Languages from the Irish and Celtic Studies section, where we've had a long-running uh, research project on uh, Northern Ireland place names. Indeed, that's what took me to Belfast first back in 1987, when I never left. Um, so I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> but in any case, so we have a long-standing interest in place name study, uh, as particularly as part of our shared inheritance here in Northern Ireland. Uh, people always have an interest in where they come from. Uh, it seems to us, and we've we see this time and time again when we go and give talks, no matter what part of the country we go to. People are listening to where they come from and they're interested in the origins of their names. Uh, and this, uh, it seems to be an interest which is insatiable, so uh, this work is ongoing. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about matters which in a way pertain to our uh, late and great playwright Brian Freel, who of course died earlier this year. He was somebody who was held in high regard by us all. He was a fantastic playwright. Brought uh, drama to the international stage and was particularly famous for his play Translations which deals precisely with the topic I'm interested in today and that is the issue of if you like the naming traditions in our two great languages Irish and English in this island of course in Ulster we also have to factor in the Scots influence uh, and that is something to <coughs> touch on uh, so we have naming traditions across a variety of languages uh, and these make life interesting and they make life for people like me who are trying to decipher names complicated as well. So we're going to be talking about some of these things. Now Brian Freed in his play, uh, obviously from the title translations, uh, that suggests uh, that in the course of the 19th century in the Ordnance Survey, which is the period of time in which he located his great play, in, and he located it in Donegal, a fictitious place called Ballybeg, as you know, uh, that suggests that our names were translated, those which were in Irish were translated into English uh, and placed on the maps for the first time in the 19th century. Uh, there is a little bit of artistic license in that, in that that's not entirely what happened indeed, it's not what happened most of the time. It's a bit more complicated, different things happened and I'm going to try and explain to you the variety of things that happened to our names in the transition from one and in the transfer from one language to another, uh, because that is interesting and because it is complicated. Uh, what I'll be saying is that of course and this may not surprise you, but what would be reminding us of is the fact that most of our names were not lost or erased <coughs> in the process of the transition from Irish to English. Other things did happen to them, sometimes names were lost, but that was a minority of cases. Uh, in actual fact, most of our names made a transition from one language into the other because people used them and adhered to them and needed them. <coughs> uh, so these are the sorts of things we're going to be looking at. So, uh, the title, Barbarous and Uncouth, these are not my words, they're the words of King Charles II, uh, and I'll be putting that in context uh, for you for a moment, in a moment's time, uh, because we're going to be looking in particular at the 17th century, which is the great century in terms of, if you like, its influence to this day in this place, it's the key century. Uh, I think we'd all agree in terms of our complex relations and our, our mixed community, you know, and uh, these other things which make us distinctive in Ulster in particular. Um, so, uh, just to remind ourselves, of course, that the current situation is not the situation that pertained to the 17th century. The current situation is, in terms of the Irish language, is concerned with particular, I have a particular interest in the Irish language, obviously, and we're talking, and this is part of a series on the Irish language, so I'm conscious of all of that. But the current situation, of course, in Ireland is that the Irish language as a spoken language, spoken by a community on a daily basis between father and daughter and mother and son and grandchildren and grandparent as a natural community language is confined uh, in traditional terms, I mean there are communities which speak the language in urban settings in parts of Belfast and Dublin and elsewhere. But as a traditional community language is confined very much to the western seaboard and we see that here in these darkened areas on our map. Uh, in the 17th century of course things were much more complicated. Uh, Irish was spoken by the majority of the people but English was introduced by English settlers and the Scottish settlers were particularly complicated because there were two national languages in Scotland at that point. There was the Scots language which is a relative of English, but was distinct from English at that point in time in the southern part of Scotland and the eastern seaboard, and in the north and west, Gaelic, which of course was a close relation of Irish. So the Scots were complicated, they came here, some of them came here bilingual, I'm sure, already, and some of them came with one language or the other, and all of that added to the great rich mix we have in this place. So, in any case, uh, let's start first and foremost with the story of uh, 
Irish contact with English. Linguists talk about contact between languages. We talk about language contact as a process, and this happens in every part of the world. Ireland is different than anywhere else. But our contact with English is older sometimes than people might allow for. We're, as I've said, yes, our 17th century is the crucial period in, in terms of uh, Ulster in particular, and Northern Ireland in, uh, in, uh, from a contemporary perspective. Uh, but English has been spoken in Ireland and in Ulster, including Ulster in that, for longer than three or four hundred years. Indeed, English was brought with the Anglo Norman Conquest post 1169, uh, at which point in time the variety of English that was spoken was known as Middle English. So we have English settlers in that period, and we can see that in our landscape. So there are place names in County Down, which are of English language origin, like Bally Walter, is one which comes to mind, which started life as Walter's tomb. Walter's Town in the 12th, late 12th century, 13th century, as the population became bilingual English and Irish, and they moved from English into Irish and became Bala Walter, became Gaelicized, to became Bala, which is the Irish equivalent, and then re emerged in the 17th century in English spelling as Bally Walter. So things are much more complicated than people can think. So there are parts of County Down where English had a strong foothold from the 12th century for a period of time, and we see that in our place names. People more often think of, of course, the 17th century period, they think of the Elizabethan and the Stuart plantations, uh, and at which time we're talking about another variety of English, early modern English. Uh, and from that period in particular, we have the permanent language shift from Irish to English as far as the great number of people in this island are concerned. So from around about 1600 on. Now, the 17th century is of great interest. And uh, this quotation from the Act of Explanation, which dates the period of Charles II, King Charles II, 1665 to be precise. And the uh, wording of this order from the king is most interesting for those of us who are interested in places. Let's read it and see if it brings a smile to your faces, because it certainly goes to mind, but then perhaps I have a strange sense of humour, but let's see. Uh, an order from the king stating that the barbarous and uncouth names of places in Ireland much retired the reformation of the country and directing the Lord Lieutenant and Council to change such names into others more suitable to the English tongue, annexing the ancient names in every grant so altered. Now I need to unpack and explain that a little bit for you. In the course of the 17th century, uh, with the plantation of Ulster in particular, and this as far as this probably I was concerned, what we get for the first time is uh, uh, a situation where our names are recorded in writing in great numbers, sir. Our townland names, our smallest of administrative units in the island of Ireland is the townland, or 60,000 plus in the whole of the island. Uh, and most of those names were never recorded in the Irish language <coughs> because Irish sources were not bureaucratic. They weren't sources that were concerned with government. Uh, but with the 17th century uh, and the great upheaval, political, political upheaval that we get at the start of the 17th century, and then the plantation, and then the transfer of lands, we get names being recorded for the first time in inquisitions, which is an inquiry as to what lands existed and where, what they were called. And then we get the granting of those lands to an English or Scottish undertaker. Uh, and then from that point on, we get these lands appearing again in rentals. We get them appearing in maps. We get them appearing in all sorts of documentation from the 17th century on. Um, but these names, as they were recorded, of course, at the beginning of the 17th century, 17th century had legal title attached to them. Because if you're inquiring what the lands are, and you're recording their names, and then you grant those lands to an undertaker, and that undertaker then breaks down those lands to, to uh, rent out to his tenants, then those names become important. They're not just names anymore, but there, there are places attached to them, there are acreages attached to them, there are lands attached to them, and they have, there's legal title involved. So, in this last line, Annex and the Ancient Names and Every Grant so altered, I want to explain that to you, because these names appear then in grants, uh, these Irish names, the names of the towns, appear in grants, uh, and therefore they have, as I say, they have uh, a legal importance attached to them from the beginning of the 17th century. So that, uh, therefore, these names were not easily removed or re-raised uh, because they were attached to lands and uh, land ownership. Uh, and therefore this, if you like, uh, uh, ideological position taken in this order was one that wasn't going to be easy to enforce or act on because clearly from this court itself, what I'm suggesting is, well, these are Irish language names. They are, appear barbarous because they're in a different language, not in the English language, the language of Shakespeare. <laughs> so they appear barbarous and uncouth. We'd wish to alter that, we'd wish to change these names into others more suitable to the English tongue. 
what we're implicit in that is the fact that well, that would be easy to do. So we'd have to, if we managed to do this, we'd have to have an Ir in, a new English language name and, a, and the old Irish language name side by side for a time until eventually the English one outs with the Irish one. Do you know what I mean? And that was going to be a cumbersome process. The second thing I have to say is, of course, this is just an order in a, uh, in a document which relates to uh, the reign of Charles II and is said to have come from the king himself. It doesn't, of course, mean at all that any of the people of Ulster at this time, whether they be a settler or Irish origin, would pay any heed to it. Uh, and of course, that's another thing which is of interest and we should talk about it more in a moment. Now, the great surveyor of the 17th century in Ireland was a man called Sir William Petty. He's responsible for the Down Survey and the census of 1659. So basically, the great mapping project of the Cromwellian period is to be connected with this man, Sir William Petty. And he got the contract for mapping of Ireland, the mapping of the whole of Ireland in 1654. And of course, again, the allocation of confiscated lands to uh, Protestant adventurers and settlers, because religion now would become a crucial issue, as we know. Uh, and indeed, the share of land uh, altered dramatically in the course of the 17th century in Ireland uh, from 20% in Protestant hands, 26% by the end of that century. Uh, I only mention this because one might therefore assume that with that transition of lands from, you know, from a Catholic uh, community to a Protestant community, that would necessarily facilitate, that would facilitate, if you like, also the transfer of names, for, or the changing or altering of names, the erasure of names in, Irish, in the Irish language, and they are being replaced by the English language. Because people, well, let's be honest, uh, people do make too easy an assumption uh, about uh, our uh, population in our communities on the basis of religion and there is often an assumption on, on the part of many people that if you are from the Protestant community then you were would, you would have been an English speaker in the 17th century uh, or perhaps a Scots speaker and if you're from the Irish Catholic community you would have been an Irish speaker and of course these things are far 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 more complicated than that much more complicated than that uh, and therefore if we're going to if we assume for a moment that just because that lands change from Catholic to Protestant hands, and that necessarily means that the language situation follows suit very easily and very neatly. That's not the case. And we see that in the context of our names as well, uh, as we shall, as I'll explain it more and more. Now, Petty indeed did agree with this order of Charles II, or at least seemed to take a similar position in that he too commented on the Irish names being unintelligible. Um, and it would not be in this if a significant part of the Irish names were interpreted, by which I mean, I, I assume they were translated. Where they are not or cannot be abolished. Implicit in that is also the fact that he too appreciated this was going to be difficult because the names of the title of that appeared in Grants and Lands, as they say. He compiled an index of place names uh, 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 and would have wished for, again, in line with the order of Charles II, for names in English to be attached to these and the new names, uh, the new names to appear therefore on the record from this point, uh, because as he puts it here, owners desire to have lands henceforth called by new names in English. But in actual fact, this didn't happen. This didn't happen at all. So, uh, if you like, I'm taking the King's order and Petty's, if you like, further development of that in terms of what he says about his project and what he's doing. Neither of the, this does not come to pass. So that most of our names were preserved. Uh, and we'll talk about how they're preserved uh, now in the second part of this lecture. So, this is the question, names that would be more suitable to the English tongue. To what extent did this happen in Ireland in the 17th century? That the Irish names were supplanted by names in English, translated, or indeed uh, given new names in total. And secondly, did the transfer of lands and language and the language shift from Irish to English, which did start in the 17th century, did that indeed mean that old names, Irish names were erased, uh, and that a whole new set of names were composed for places in the country? But to a whole new corpus of names. These are the two questions, which I've already suggested uh, an answer to, but now we'll develop a bit more. Now, the Ordnance Survey is the crucial period, as I said uh, at the start of the lecture, in the 19th century, because what was important about the Ordnance Survey was that it mapped all of our names for the first time. Now, we did have maps before the 19th century, but no map mapped every single name, every single town and name, or the, distinct, or the divisions within them, the minor toponyms, the minor names. So the Ordnance Survey was the first comprehensive, com really truly comprehensive mapping project uh, for the whole of the <coughs> Uh And Brian Freel chose to locate his play in the context of that Ordnance Survey, uh, which took place between the years 1833 and 46. 
And it's interesting just to know what he had to say about what he felt about the Ordnance Survey and why he chose to locate this great play about identity and about language shift, which is really what it's about, and relationships, what it's really about between Irish and English and so on. Uh, uh, it's interesting to know how we contextualise that by the Ordnance Survey, what he felt the Ordnance Survey was about. And these are his words, Brian Freed's own words, in an interview in which he, uh, which was um, uh, recorded in the Guardian newspaper in 1980. He said, new places were put on those maps. These are the Ordnance Survey maps of the 19th century. The towns and villages were given anglicised names, which is means anglicisation, of course, refers to the process where an Irish name uh, is given in English spelling, okay, in keeping with the spelling system of English. We'll come back and talk about that too. A whole country was rechristened. <coughs> so this was how Brian Free saw it. I don't quite see it like that. Uh, and I'll tell you why as we uh, <coughs> near the end. So the key questions for me are, of what I wanted to share with you, is what is the nature of the anglicisation of Irish police things? What does that mean? What form does it take? What does it look like? Is anglicisation really all about translating names from Irish into English? And was the process all one way? In other words, was it always about Irish names going into English? Did English names ever make their way to the Irish language? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. As I illustrated a moment ago with the case of Walter's tomb becoming Banawatcha. So, <coughs> Gaelicisation uh, is another term we'd have to look at then. In other words, the process whereby an English language name was dropped into the Irish language and became part of the, if you like, the landscape of the country. Uh, this is interesting because it was something that in the Middle Ages, the king and government, which was then limited to the pale, of course, by and large, was conscious of. And here's an interesting reference which I thought I'd show you. 1360, King Edward III, the Sheriff of the Cross, and Shemeskel of the Liberty of Kilkenny, which was uh, heavily Anglo Norman at this period. Uh, and this is the quote uh, from this document. Many of the English, in other words, those in Ireland who were of English ancestry, going back to 1169, refused to obey our laws and customs. These are the laws of king and government. Hold parliaments in Dublin after the Irish fashion, <coughs> learn to speak the Irish tongue and send their children among the Irish to be nursed, that's by which is meant fostered, the Irish custom of fosterage, where your son, the son of a noble man, a woman was sent to another noble family to be fostered for a period of time, and taught the Irish tongue. So that the people of English race in Ireland have for the greater part become Irish. So this is sort of, if you like, some historical evidence to back up what we see in the placements. Placements going from, which were formed in the, in the English language in the first instance, after the anglo Roman invasion, like Walter's tomb, being brought into the Irish language and becoming by the watch and becoming gain size. So it's just an instance of the process in that other direction. The Lord Chancellor in 1578 noted that all the English, again of English origin in Ireland was what he meant, and the most part with delight, even in Dublin speak Irish, and greatly are spotted in manners, habit and conditions with Irish stains. <laughs> so he saw this obviously as corruption on the part of the English of, I of, of the Irish of English origin, if you like, uh, of the period. So clearly, languages, you know, can be shared across ethnicities, and people, when they are in close proximity, do learn each other's languages and become bilingual in the language, and they can uh, obviously move from the position of having just one language to two, which was indeed what happened, and therefore names can move between one tradition and the other, which is what I'm really interested in, in both directions. The implications for place names is very interesting. This is a fascinating reference from the year 1307. It's to do with the county Limerick again, anglo Norman settlement was so widespread throughout Ireland, much more so than perhaps we now realise. But in this case, in County Limerick, we have on record a man called General Tancred, who was clearly of English, his family were clearly of anglo Norman, uh, English origin. And he brought a case uh, uh, for the restoration of lands. We don't know why he lost his lands in the first instance, but he lost his lands in County Limerick. And he brought a case uh, uh, for the restoration of his lands. But the case was lost because he had employed the Irish name. Bally Tankard, now Tankard is his surname, the town land of Tankard, uh, he had uh, employed this name in his <coughs> documentation uh, rather than the English original Tankard's tomb, uh, and the case was lost. But it's a very nice instance of uh, saying to the kids for us just, you know, here's a name, Tankard's tomb starts out in English, given by English settlers in County Limerick in the 12th, mid 12th, early 13th century. These English settlers become bilingual, the name passes from English into Irish. So you have two versions of the name now, Tankard's Tomb and Bally Tankard, do you understand? And, uh, and uh, people wouldn't necessarily think of looking at Bally Tankard nowadays that this name with ever any English background, but it did. 
So we've seen that also as a city. And loads and loads of examples in County Down, especially in parts of County Antrim. So therefore, if I just is not too difficult to follow. We can have a situation where we have an English name, Tankard's tomb, going into Irish as Baila Hankard, which would be the Irish form, once it was borrowed into the Irish language, and then reappears in the 17th century when Irish gives way to English again in this spelling, Bally Tankard. But the question now is, is this English? This is the original name in English, Tankard's tomb. So what is this? What did people think it was at the time? Do you know? So we have an English language name being brought into the Irish language, reappearing in English spelling. Huh? So the people who probably transcribed this name at the time probably thought that was pure Irish. They were simply giving an English spelling to what, to, to what they heard as an Irish name. Do you understand? Now we now see these names as English. So Belfast is, is our English version of Bill Fetish, isn't it? Huh? But in the first instance, when Bill Fetish was first committed to writing in English, and by, at that point, it was spelled B-E-L-F-A-R-S-T. There was an R in there, which is closer to the Irish again, you know. Uh, people probably thought when they were writing that name down in English, that they were simply writing down the Irish, but just using the only system of spelling they had, which was English. Do you understand that? People, so the officials of government were simply transcribing Irish names and using their own system. It was the only system they had. They weren't Irish speakers, for the most part. So uh, these things are, when you start to think about them, it's a little bit more complicated. So our corpus of names in Ireland, then, our corpus of Irish names, includes names of Gaelic language origin, the majority, but it also includes Gaelicized names which originate in the English language. And that was the point I wanted to make. And that illustrates, again, the complexity of our relationships. Anglicization, now I want to talk about, which is maybe the more common uh, process with which we're familiar, because the greater number of our names start out in the Irish language, they're not English language names to start with, the greater number of Irish language names. Uh, and therefore, what is Anglicization? What does that mean? It means, uh, we think we know what it means. It means that the name originated, is an Irish language name that has been brought into the English language and can spell to an English spelling system. Okay? So it's really a borrowing. A name in this case, then, an Irish name like Bill Fetish, is really being borrowed from the English language into, or from the Irish language into the English language, and then takes on a spelling in English, which settles down as Belfast after a period of time. Um, so I would call this onomastic borrowing, the borrowing of the name from one language to the other. This happens in other countries. Think of uh, any of us who have ever been in the United States and think of some of the names we encountered there. Mississippi, and Massachusetts, and Iowa. These are all Indian names, American Indian names, which have been borrowed into the English language in America uh, and given an English language spelling, Iowa, W-A. I have no idea whether that Indian tribe ever had the letter A, or indeed if they ever even wrote down their name, Iowa. But it's the same process. It's a name in which relates in one language has been borrowed through contact between the two peoples into another language and surviving in that other language in a spelling system which is acceptable in that other language, in this case English. So we might call that then Anglicization. How this happened, I think at the start of the 17th century was probably dictation in the first place, in other words that you had people in Ireland who were Irish speakers who were asked what their names were. I mentioned the word Inquisition to you earlier on and this is the sort of process that happens. So uh, you see records of Inquisitions taking place, for example, in Armagh City. Armagh was a plantation county. So you'd have, I've come across records such as uh, the officials of the Crown brought together a body of people in Armagh to ask of them their names. And then these uh, people from Armagh, Irish speakers from Armagh, give the names in the locality, the names that belong to the, the lands that belong to the church and their names, because that was a big player in Armagh. The church was a very big player in Armagh. As you might expect, the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland. So, all the lands belong to the church, list the names. All the lands belong to the O'Neill, list the names. All the, lang the lands belong to somebody else, and those names were listed. But somebody was writing down those names. And my idea is that whoever was writing down those names need, may have had some Irish, but may not have had some Irish. But in any case, he, it was probably he rather than she, let's face it, in the 17th century. I'm sorry to all the women in the audience. Uh, but he probably just then writes, that's okay, yeah, write that down then. And you write it down using. The only system you know, which is the English system. Uh, so you're really transcribing the language, the, these Irish names in an English orthography. The word orthography means the spelling system of English. Uh, so it's not really translation. Therefore, Belfast can't be called a name. It can't be called a translation. Do you know what I mean? With all respect to Brian Freed's great play, we can't really call Belfast a translated name, can we? Because it doesn't mean anything in English, does it? Uh, so what it is, is it's a transliteration. It's been transliterated from the Irish language into the English language. In other words, 
It's been left alone, but the English speakers are simply trying to represent it as best they can in the English. Right? But the, what we're not getting is this city, which would be a bit of a wind, it wouldn't for our signage, mouth of the sandbag food. It's not really going to work that well, is it? So, simply, so what we're getting there is people simply accepting the names as they find them, for the most part. They're not doing what Charles II would have perhaps wished, or what Petty might have perhaps wished. People are accepting the names that they find in the place, right? in the same way as they accepted the names they found in Indian, Indian areas of America. And they're adopting those names and bringing them into their new language, English in both countries. And that is, for me, what is happening with the bulk of our names in this island. Annexation, which again, which is what Charles II talked about, He's, he had this idea, as I tried to explain to you, where, okay, you have these Irish names, but because they're barbarous and uncouth, <laughs> then we're going to supply a new English language name side by side. So that, that idea would be something like this, for example. This is the name of a town living in County Armagh, and a boy, or Rosebrook, is the name of a town land very near the city. Uh, I have a particular interest in Armagh because I'm working on, God, <laughs> dare to say it, but I'm working on a book on County Armagh, which someday will appear. I hope. <laughs> but I have a lot of it done by now, but I have to finish it. But in any case, there's a townland here called Annaboy and Rosebrook. It's one townland, not two. But Annaboy is clearly the old Irish name, Annach Bui, the yellow marsh, perhaps the yellow referring to the vegetation, the flowers. Yeah. Uh, Annach Bui is transliterated by the first people to encounter it in English. They say, Annach Bui, right, how do we spell that in English then? Uh, and in that GH. GH in the 17th century was pronounced like a CH in Irish, Annach. English speakers had that sound at that time, and they still do in parts of Scotland. And this is how it's represented in English spelling. And here then we have a new name. In actual fact, how did this new name come about? It came about as the name of a house within the townland, Rosebrook. Huh? Uh, and the name of that how prominent house within the townland then becomes part of the townland name itself. So the townland now has a double name, Annaboy or Rosebrook. And that you might call annexation, where a new name is appended to the old name, and the two exist side by side. But that, doesn't, that happens, but it doesn't happen that often. Uh, it doesn't really happen that often. <coughs> what you do get is new, you get new coinages. In other words, because you have a new population coming into uh, Ulster in particular in the 17th century who speak English, or Scots, or Scottish Gaelic. As I say, that's, Scots are very complicated. Uh, but let's keep it more simple for the moment and let's talk just about English. Uh, Derry, London Derry, of course, was a plantation county as well, as is, of course, evident from the one of the two forms of the name that is used in this, in this community, London Derry, the connection with the London companies who, who took on the plantation in that part of Ulster. Uh, and that commemorates that fact, the London companies, the London Irish companies, as they call themselves. But there were towns, therefore, in that county which bear testimony to the fact that there were new, there were new people from England who came in to settle here and brought their own trades and skills with them. And Draper's Town is one very clear example. It was connected with the Draper's Company. We also have a Salter's town, to the best of my knowledge, and others. And that clearly is an English name. We understand it as English speakers. I'm an English speaker. You all here are English speakers. Uh, and we, we understand it. It's transparent to us in a way that Anna Boyle is not, unless we have the Irish language. Right? This clearly is an English language name, which is given by English speakers in the new situation in this period. Translation we do get occasionally, which again, as I say, is the title of Brian Freud's plays. But the greater number of our names Pass from Irish into English without being translated. That's not what happens for the greater number. But there are some examples. <coughs> so, Kyle and Adigan is a place in Armagh, uh, and it appears in English as Silverwood, which is a precise and accurate translation of the original Irish name. Okay, so it does happen occasionally. So, Silverwood is a needed translation from the Irish Kyle and Adigan. But sometimes the process of translation is not accurate. So, here we have one which is in Galway, Claren Bridge. Some of you may have come across it if you're ever down eating oysters in Galway, <laughs> which I'd recommend. <laughs> but uh, Claren, I was a student in Galway for six years, so I, I know the place well. And then <coughs> Claren Bridge is a semi-translation in my view. I call it a semi-translation because Claren is simply a transliteration of the Irish word Claudine, a little board. But bridge translates the Irish thread because thread in Irish means a bridge. So this one is a semi-translation. It's part translation, thread is translated as bridge, but this part is not translated, it's simply just borrowed into English and given an English spelling. So that's transliteration as opposed to translation, as is the way I would see it. And sometimes they get it wrong. Who's they? How did this happen? Well, there can be reasons which we could get into maybe in more detail, but just for the moment, let's just look at this one. This is a place called Freshford in County Kenny, that's its normal name, that's what people call it, Freshford. We know that that has the original name in Irish was Ahu Ur. 
Aqua was a very common word in Ulster, in particular, and in Scotland as well, because of course Scotland came to kindred culture, and Gaelic there as well. As I said, in the north and west in particular, it appears in Ach Macloy, a name we'd all be familiar with in Tyrone. So that word Ach in English, A U G H, is Irish Achu, which means a feed, simply a feed. It's very, very common in Ulster and in Scotland especially. Uh, so uh, Achu Ur strictly means the fresh field. Okay? Maybe fresh in terms of grazing, I come from farming stock, so I can imagine that you could give that a name to a field. You could say, well, it's the land, the pasture we keep for later on in the year, that'd be fresh pasture for the animals, you know? So I could see how that sort of name could be composed. Ahu Ur, fresh feed. But look how it appears in English, fresh ford. So something's gone wrong. Why? What's gone wrong is that this word Ahu has been mixed up with the word A, which also appears in our place names in the form of A T H normally, but sometimes as A U G H also, or simply A G H. And A, a ford, and Ahu have been mixed up. Okay? In this bilingual situation, they've been mixed up and the name is being misinterpreted. Then whoever first put this translation on it in English thought they were dealing with A, ford, rather than Ahu, feed. So the name has been mistranslated accordingly. But transliteration, as I say, is by far the most common process. So here, I think, are some very straightforward examples, at least I hope they are. Here we have a name, Yis Moor. It's a name of a diocese in County, well, central in County Waterford, but a diocese is bigger than any county, so it's really the southeast of the island. Yis Moor, uh, and here it appears in English, Yis Moor. Now, what's Yis Moor? It's simply a spelling in English of the original Irish name. It doesn't seek to translate it. It doesn't seek to interpret it. It doesn't seek to change it. All it is is simply representing in English spelling the Irish name. You do not get I and O in this combination in English, so you can't have that. So it's simply reduced to I here. And of course, the Irish word more or great, well, we, this word M-O-R-E is very common in English, and you can see how that could become the spelling of English, even if, uh, uh, and there is, of course, a semantic link between the two. Great and more are two words that are related in, in a semantic sense, in a sense, uh, in, in terms of what they mean. So you can see how that would be, how that equation would happen. Ahu bo, Feed of the cows is what that means. That's not a translation, is it? It's a transliteration. It is simply brought into English and given in English spelling. Now, sometimes in that process, sometimes in that process, what happens is that because the name now has come into English and been borrowed into English, sometimes part of the name is subject to what I might call rationalization. In other words, that an effort is made to identify part of the name with a word which is familiar in English. In a way, that's perhaps what's going on here, as I said. But it's definitely what's going on here. Galliv, the Irish word for the county and town or city of Galway, Galliv, right, which is originally the name of the river, actually, which goes through. Right? This comes into English as Galway eventually, where the word, the second part of the word, is if you like, okay, it's brought into English in the first instance, but then it's given a shape, if you like, that's more familiar. In other words, that it's interpreted as a word which makes some sense to English speakers. Do you understand? The word way. But in actual fact, way is no part at all in the original Irish. It's not a translation of the original Irish in any shape or form. It's just a further stage in this transliteration process where the word is brought into English and then in the course of anglicization it may sometimes take on a shape whereby its part of the name is made into a recognizable word in English. Do you understand what I'm saying? Likewise with Bale Fenerstre, originally anglicized as Bale First. F-A-R-S-T, with the R in it, which clearly is closer to the original Irish, R-S-T. So in 17th century documents, to do with this part of Ireland, you get Belfast, B-L-F-A-R-S-T, or variants of that kind. But F-A-R-S-T, R-S-T is not a common combination in English, and the R disappears over time. And what does it mean with Belfast? And fast is a recognisable English word. So there's something psychologically going on, I think, you know, that people are trying to attach to it, to attach some sort of semblance of meaning to the names or some way they can get their tongues around them and get a grip on them, you know? Sometimes it can involve what I call phonetic erosion, which, by which I mean is that part of the name is lost or eroded. So that Corky, the original Irish name of Cork, the second part of the name is lost completely in. And we just get Cork now, rather than Corky. Okay? Which you might expect. Okay? If, uh, uh, so part of the name is lost. I call that erosion. But sometimes the name is outright corrupted. So a place called Jishad Nood in County Roscommon appears ultimately in English as Easter Snow, where somebody has really gone overboard and tried to make 
some sense of an original Irish name by, if you like, supplanting onto that, uh, or, or transposing onto that two words in English that make some sort of sense, uh, but not, strictly speaking, in terms of the name itself. So, my conclusion, if I can form a conclusion for you, would be that although there were some, indeed the king himself, and Sir William Petty in the 17th century, who might have wished for the place names of Ireland to be, uh, uh, how would we put it, to be supplanted by a new naming system, which in their view was more compatible with the English tongue, and were prepared to contemplate new, which uh, their preference would have been names which were English in origin and transparent and understandable in English. This is not what happened. In other words, the people who used them, irrespective of their religious background or political leaning or anything else, that's not how they were, that's not what happened in effect. You know? The people held on to their names because the names became part of a shared heritage. And they're still part of a shared heritage, I would put to you, uh, in this place. I mean, if there's any element of Irish language studies, which is an easy sell, I'm speaking as somebody who's taught Irish in Queens for many, many years. I know I don't look that old, it's very kind of you. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I've been there for many years. You begin to feel it a bit now at this stage, but I've been there for many, many years. The easiest thing to sell if you're an Irish language person in a society which has had its division, let's be honest about it, and it's where language sometimes forms a part of those divisions and people sometimes make assumptions about language. The easiest part of Irish language studies to sell is Irish place name studies because people all feel attached to where they come from. So wherever you come from, you tend to be have an attachment to that place and you may have, and arising from that, you have an interest in the names. You may have to accept that the name may mean something in the Irish language or the Scots language or whatever. And people uh, are very open to that. So names were not erased. I would say to the names were embraced. They were embraced by all, whatever their uh, linguistic or cultural background. The names passed from one language to the other and were preserved in English. So what we're really talking about is not erasure, and in that sense, I disagree with Brian Freed, if that's not, doesn't seem cheeky of me, because this was a great, great dramatist. But just being, if we want to be really, really accurate about it, I don't think we can talk about erasure. Most of our names were not erased, discarded or lost. What they were was assimilated and brought into the English language, just like Indian names were brought into the English language in America. Uh, in the same way as the Irish people moved, for the most part, I would say regrettably, because I would rather we have still more bilingualism in Ireland, because I'm an Irish speaker, of course I would say that, but with the shift from Irish to English in Ireland, the names moved with the people. That's what I'm trying to say to you. They moved, just the people changed from Irish language speaking to English language speaking, the names were brought with them into the English language. Uh, and this was a pragmatic process. Uh, I'm not saying they necessarily thought about it very deeply or anything else. And I'm certainly not saying it was a malign process necessarily, but I'm saying it was a pragmatic process. And I try to explain to you how some of the reasons for that would be that title land was connected with names and that, in a way, had to protect our names and had to preserve them, such that we still have them to this day. So thank you very much for your time and attention.